Hello, and welcome to the Grand Cinema Hotel, a podcast hosted by three friends who love cinema. I'm Nathan, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Gus and Alvaro. Tonight, you'll be staying in Room 116, Unforgiven, the 1992 revisionist western directed by legendary Clint Eastwood. So go ahead, get comfortable, and throw on that Do Not Disturb sign as we ride into Unforgiven. You'd be William Money out of Missouri. Kill women and children. That's right. I've killed women and children. Killed just about everything that walks or crawled at one time or another. And I'm here to kill you, little Bill. Howdy, all you retired gunslingers. Thanks for checking back in the Grand Cinema Hotel. We are back, and we are back with a film that is very close to my own heart. Um, we're doing Unforgiven this week, first Western that we're doing on the podcast. What an incredible movie. First Gene Hackman movie as First, well. Also first Gene Hackman movie. How can't can believe I we went this far. <laughs> how, could we, how could we go this long are, without... Are we truly a movie podcast if we don't have a Gene Hackman movie on here? No, but just like how this movie is a revisionist story, this is a revisionist <laughs> pod. Podcast. We're correcting some uh, fallacies. We're writing some wrongs. <laughs> yeah, we're writing some wrongs in this one. Oh, man. So uh, how do you guys feel about this movie? All right, well, I watched this movie based off of your recommendation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure I would have gotten to this eventually, but the way you talk about this movie and uh, how it's been like a part of your life for a long time, I wanted to watch it just because you like it. So I was willing to do an episode on it. I, I told you even before you did, we, yeah. uh, I watched it, I was like, I'll do an episode on it just so oh we can do God. one that like... I hope he likes it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Ro? You saw this for the first time too, right? Yeah. Um, I, or well, sort of. Sort of, yeah. I had seen it with my cousin like a long time ago. He had One time when I went over, he was watching it, but I don't remember it mostly. Yeah. And I'm watching it now with a different, like having... Uh, other westerns under my belt i feel like it's um i guess to start i would say it it makes sense why it won best picture it isn't necessarily um a classic western but i think it it does a very good ode to what the genre is and i think clint eastwood being arguably one of the greatest to ever be a cowboy he he's the only one that can get it done the way it got done so i i really enjoyed the way i watched the movie like i i really enjoyed the movie I've seen it twice now. Yeah. I watched it a couple of weeks ago when we first mentioned it, and then I watched it literally the morning of this recording because I wanted to have it fresh. Fresh in your brain. Yeah. And I liked it so much better the second time. Yeah, I feel like every time I see this movie, I start liking it more. Uh, the first time I saw it, I was young, and I watched it with my grandpa at the time. And that's kind of the reason why I got into westerns, like just growing up watching all the spaghetti westerns and John Wayne movies with him. It just, I don't know, they just have a very special place in my heart. And then as I kind of gotten older, I've went back and revisited this film. And like you said, every time I see it, I feel like it just gets better and better and better. And not only just as a movie and as a Western, but like just just as like, I don't know, just this the mythos behind Clint Eastwood and the fact that he bit like this movie is basically like him reflecting on his career almost like it's just it's really cool. There's a lot to this movie. I feel So like. weird to think that this movie is like as meta as something as like Deadpool. Yeah, no, <laughs> like it really is. And like that's because I feel like it, it has something for everybody, like people that might not be super big or super knowledgeable about Westerns. Like this is just it can be a good movie. Like, you know what I mean? It's a yeah. good Western. It's very entertaining. And then for people that maybe do know a little bit more or are fans of Clint Eastwood, like, it, it holds even more weight. You know what I mean? So I just think it's a really cool movie. Um, it is funny because what is last year you got Cry Macho, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was in 2021. Like, I feel like everything after this Clint Eastwood is kind of like I have nothing to prove. And then we do get some of the other movies later that I like from him, like um, The Grand Torino. Mm -hmm. But it's not a... It still has, it's funny because it still has those Western like tropes that he it's likes him. putting in his movies. I think it's him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He knows that that's what he, like, he's known for and he's really good at it. And I think this movie also, like like you said, if you might have not seen other Westerns, I think this movie shows you why people love Westerns. Though. I think that point that you're making about like him bringing like Western motifs into some of his movies that aren't Westerns. I feel that way about like Dirty Harry too. I just think mm -hmm. it's, I just think it's him. Yeah. Like he, it's that. That tall stranger, it's the almost the man type. with no name. Yeah, yeah, the man with no name. Yeah. He brings that into everything. What I think, and especially in the movies that he directs, what I think his like what he's shown that he can do is he can take a 
not necessarily a complex movie, but he's able to lay out a movie so straightforward and like easy to digest and process that I feel like that just it makes it so much more enjoyable for everybody. He's a working man's director. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like he no excess, no fluff, just yep. he's very like conservative with the cost of the movies and like the shots and we're gonna do this once and if you get it right, that's it, we're moving on. Mm-hmm. And I've seen like uh, little like snippets of interviews with actors talking about like, well, I wanted to do it a second time, and it's like, why? So you could waste everyone's time. Like right. we already got it. I think it was Matt Damon, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> Matt Damon. You. I don't even know what the movie would be. Um, isn't it like a rugby movie or something? Oh, like the that? one, yeah, the South African rugby movie. I yeah, think, with like Nelson Mandela and stuff. Yeah, he has Invictus, a lot of, right? He has or a lot of like range, that? Clint Eastwood. Yeah, I mean, I, that, I, I'm sure that's not a hot take or anything, but yeah. I mean more in his directing mm-hmm. style. He does all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I mean, the last movie I really seen of his was Sully. Do you remember Sully with yeah. Tom Hanks about mm-hmm. the guy who landed the plane in the Hudson? Mm-hmm. That movie is a perfect example of what you're talking about. Like, it's so straightforward. And there's he tells it from a couple different like perspectives, but it's it's literally just a retelling of like a story in a court case, and then the movie ends, and right. it's like, well, that was enjoyable, yeah. But it is very like, like you said, just so digestible, yeah. Because I think the last movie that I saw that he did was was The Mule, and I mean, I thought it was a fine movie, but once again, just his ability to just to lay out these stories, and you just kind of get sucked into this world, and you go on this ride with whoever the main character is. It is it true that eighty? Year old plus Clint Eastwood has an orgy in that movie. I ought to, I, I heard he had a threesome in that film. That might have. I don't remember that part. Yeah. Maybe you think it stand out. I feel like I would remember it if that. But yeah, I, don't I know. think I, I heard did, that in I another podcast kind of talking bored about of that him. movie. So I kind of stopped paying attention. But <laughs> Giga Chad, I can't boof. believe I would have missed that. <laughs> bad. He's so fucking old in that movie, dude. It's like I, he's yeah, so yeah, fucking he, old. I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in general. Yeah. That's what's crazy to think is we get this in ninety two, and that's why it's almost a closeout to him because he's been doing it since. What, like maybe late 60s, 68, maybe something like that. And that's what I think has like a special resonance to me. Like this was my grandpa's favorite actor, you know. And yeah, it's just uh, after certain pizzazz that you guys are talking about, like just the best probably. I mean, obviously I'd have to watch more, but he just stands out. Even now that he's 90, be like, that's Clint Eastwood. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of respect. I mean, he's an amazing Hollywood icon. That's what it is. And he's an auteur. You know what I mean? He writes, he's, directs, edits. That's what I was going to say. A star. Is he really is just like part. a star. Yeah. You And when you're watching him direct, like, because I, I watched a, like, 25-minute behind the scenes about Unforgiven, you can just tell, like, he's, like, in, in one scene, he's or in one, sh- uh, like, scene from this documentary, he'll be directing and then like the camera turns on to him and he's just he goes you know you see him switch back and forth and like the way he's able to compartmentalize the directing and the acting and all the hundreds of other things directors have to take care of while they're on the set it's just really fascinating to watch honestly it is really cool he probably i mean i don't think this is a hot take either and i haven't really seen that many of them but he's easily the best like director actor Combo I, I think of so. like the same time, yeah. you know what I mean? He, I mean, no offense to Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and this, it's just different, yeah. You know, like uh, if anything takes down Quentin Tarantino's movies, it's him being in his movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, but man. with Clint Eastwood, it's it's amazing to watch, you mm-hmm. know. And uh, well, this doesn't really have anything to do with the movie, but I do think this is like a, just a cool piece of movie news going on right now. Is that like how David Lynch is going to be in the Fablesman, yeah. Steven Spielberg's yeah. movie? And there's, like, a rumor that he's going to play an old version of John Ford. Oh, really? That'd be yeah, cool. because of this, like, conversation that Steven Spielberg had with John Ford when he was young. Mm. I guess it really, like, stuck out to him and taught him a lot and meant a lot to him. So a lot of people think that David Lynch is going to play John that Ford. That would be sick, actually. And, I mean, I guess since John Ford directed Westerns, this kind of ties it all together. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I tied it. the bow on that one nicely. <laughs> Let's, we can move on. We can move on. It's a big circle. Yeah. It's a big <laughs> Western circle. Yeah, because so, so yeah, kind of hopping into the movie, I mean, like, at the time that this was made, like, Westerns were dead. You know what I mean? Like, Westerns were dead. They had been so overplayed. They were the biggest thing in cinema for maybe, like, 20, 30 years. Some of the original Marvel of the genre, like, a genre of movies just overblown at one point. People did not want them anymore. One point as in, like, 50 years? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like, honestly, like, this was, I think this was his, this was pretty much his first Western since Pale Rider in 85, which... I mean, I like that movie a lot, but it didn't hit as well as, like, some of those earlier Westerns. Um, and this was really the first big budget Western since, I think, 
Which, what was that movie? Oh, Heaven's Gate. Yeah, Heaven's Gate. I think that came out in 80. And that basically Jesus. killed, like, the production studio. I think, it was, who was it? United Artists? Yeah. So, basically, people didn't want to touch Westerns. And then this kind of floated around, like, the screenplay. The screenplay was written back in the 70s by... Um, David Peoples. David Peoples, yeah. David Webb Peoples. And the script ended up falling into the hand. Do you know who got had a hold of this for a while that wanted no. to make this? Francis Ford Coppola. Really? Yeah. So Probably would have been good. Too. I know. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So he had this, like, and he optioned it back in the 80s. And then kind of, you know, time expired, couldn't get the funding. And then Clint Eastwood got a hold of it, sat on it for a few years because I guess he wanted to get older to play the role. <laughs> like, honestly. Tight. That's cool. right. And then he ended up making the movie. So, and like, yeah, like I said, I mean, I really feel like this is just a, such a direct response to... Like his prior films, like in all those other like spaghetti westerns, the violence just runs so rampant, and it's almost like you go to the theater to watch these shootouts and these you know big spectacle gunfights and stuff, and then this is almost a movie like reflecting on an older version of these characters and like well, how does this impact people moving forward? Like how do, how does all this violence and stuff affect these families and these people themselves as they get older? And I just think that's really cool. So you said this was written back in the seventies, yeah. And it's so, that's a really interesting thing because the fact that like it came out in the nineties and it was like, okay, we're, t people are tired of Westerns and the tropes, but then it was written 20 years it was earlier. Written in a like, direct so people were response. tired of this in the seventies. Right. Yeah. It was written in a direct response to everything that was going on and it just, it just never got made. Um, which is crazy. I mean, I feel like Westerns are the most American movies, right? Yeah. yeah. I would like think so. easily, but it's just funny to think of like how overdone it was. And even now we get what, maybe one or two a year. Maybe. And then I feel like the Westerns we get now are they're Western adjacent. They're not they're I feel, I guess because unforgiven killed yeah. the Western kind of that's like, I can't really go and do that again or tell, tell the same kind of just gunslinger story. Exactly. Right. So then you start getting movies like the assassination of, Jesse James right. by the coward Robert Ford, mm -hmm. or you even get things like No Country Too for Old, old Men, mm -hmm. or There Will Be Blood, exactly. or even now you have things like Hell or High Water, yep. where they're they're Western movies, but they're not cowboy classic movies. westerns. Yeah, they're this they're this new th genre and, of western. And I think that's really the precedent that Unforgiven set. Like yeah. without this movie, I don't think those movies get made because I think westerns probably stay dead. We'd mm -hmm. probably be on our fifth version of Wyatt Earp, by exactly, now, right? or nothing gets made. Yeah, like you know what I mean. They just completely die. So I think the fact that Eastwood shows that you can still make westerns, but you have to deviate away from the classic western. Because I mean, who wants to see the same fucking movie a million times? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think another thing that I uh, that I think is really cool about this movie is originally in the screenplay, like because like I was talking about, like violence in westerns and stuff, like it's almost overdone. And I know Peoples when he wrote the screenplay originally, he didn't want to show any violence. He, he wanted everything to be off screen. He didn't want to show anything because he just felt like it kind of takes away from like the weight and the gravity of the situation. If you show like all this fake violence that movie does, like movies do, but he saw Taxi Driver and he saw that you can do violence in like an appropriate way that still holds weight and gravity. And I think that that's what this movie really does is all like the shootout at the end and the violence between you know towards the whore in the beginning. Like it's brutal it's close up it's in your face it's not like this glorified you know people miss so i think it's cool yeah that the taxi driver thing i've seen that floating around yeah in the film it's, internet world of like, that's a comparison for like how how to quote unquote correctly convey violence, violence. in a movie right yeah because i think that's what this movie does is it really just it's very morally ambiguous and it leaves you to answer the questions on is this killing worth it like is this violence acceptable is just an appropriate reaction to what happens yeah definitely i there are many questionable things about every single person in mm -hmm. this movie um even clint eastwood he's a you know he's like a retired gunslinger and all that but him even doing like going back for this one last ride is he's he thinks it's like something that would make his wife proud but in all reality it's not right the fact that you were so easily willing to slip back into being a violent person and by justifying it by like, well, they cut up a lady. Like how does this impact it goes you to show, at all? Yeah, is that he wasn't even really was he only this way because of his wife and now that she's gone, like he's just kinda like itching for a way to get back into this world because I also think that the ending is the ending of this movie leaves you with this idea of like, well, 
does he go back to his kids or does he, you know, that classic like man alone taking off into the sunset? Like, does he go back to being that person? Yeah. Like right. Will Money, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's interesting because the end of the movie, like, it tells you, you know, they went out to San Francisco. Supposedly. Right. Prosper and dry. Yeah. It's like, who knows though? So it does leave you open with that. I um, mean, even at that time, San Francisco is still the, is the old West, you yeah. know? So it's not like he went to a very, a much more civilized area. <laughs> right. And I think it's interesting too, because throughout this whole movie, like when they're riding out to big whiskey, like Clint Eastwood the whole time, he's just keeps trying to justify to him and everybody else. Like, this is not me. I have changed. But in every, like you said, every instance of why he has changed, his wife did it. My wife cured me. My wife cured my drinking. So it's like, my you, wickedness. did you, did you do, have you changed? You know what I mean? Like yeah. deep down, have you changed? And I think that's a question that's asked throughout the movie. So, Clint Eastwood's just worried that people think people can't change. <laughs> that was so funny. Can't people change? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's let's hop into it. I guess um, you got the synopsis. I do right? have a little synopsis. Um, it's a retired old West gunslinger William Money uh, reluctantly takes on one last job with the help of his old partner Ned Logan, played by Morgan Freeman, um, and a young man, the Schofield kid, who's played by James Wolvelt um, or Wolvet. Um, so yeah, basically the movie kind of starts off with in this little town of big whiskey, Wyoming, and you're in a whorehouse and basically this, this whore gets cut up by one of the Johns. Um, yeah. And because he's got a small dick, <laughs> which like, yeah. it's, it's honestly kind of funny at first. And then as the scene kind of goes on, it's, it's not so funny. Oh, definitely no. not. Um, this brings us to my man, Gene Hackman. Yep. Right. Which at this point in the film you're with Gene Hackman. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He's you're like, sheriff. okay, he's the sheriff. Um, but I had told you before I had even seen this movie that, or not, well, not before I had seen it, but when I like gave him a little report the next day, I was like, I was so sad to find out that it wasn't Clint Eastwood and Gene Hackman being part like team. Going, yeah. yeah. Right. I was like, oh man, no, Gene Hackman's he's not a the, bad guy. He's not the good guy. <laughs> oh man. But, uh, you know, you're with him in the beginning and, you see how he handles this situation, which is n- probably not good mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, this guy cut up a woman's face and all he has to do is give back some ponies to the owner. Right. He doesn't even have to ever actually apologize or try to right his wrong to the woman who he cut up. It's about the owner. Exactly. That the owner... Prop, the owner's property. Literally, because the, the owner's not even concerned about her safety or anything. He just pulls out, like, their contract and is like, this, this is, is my this legally is my binding document. Yeah. I brought her all the way from Boston. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> originally, yeah, like, little Bill wanted to whip him and, like, you know, the other prostitutes, um, they didn't think that was good enough. They wanted to hang him. Yeah, They're they like, wanted him not going to kill him. Exactly. Like, what kind of precedent does this show? Like, you can cut somebody up and disfigure somebody and you maybe get whipped. And then you don't even get whipped. You just have to give them some horses. Like, yeah, the punishment is not even immediate. It's like, no. oh, when the, when the snow thaws. Yeah, in six months, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Bring us some horses. So, <laughs> yeah, so that kind of starts it off, and, you know, the prostitutes get together, and they're pissed, like, rightfully so, and they, they kind of scrunch up some money and uh, put a bounty on these two cowboys that disfigured this, you know, one of their, one of their coworkers. Um, and word kind of, obviously, you know, how it works in the Old West, bounty word travels by mouth, and it ends up, we, we see... Um, Clint Eastwood on his pig farm. It's also because it seems to be a good amount of money at that time. A thousand bucks. They all put their money together, yeah. Back in, what is it, like 1880, 1890 or 1880 something? 1880, because in the beginning it says that Clint, e- Clint Eastwood's wife passes in 1878. Okay, yeah, and two so years later. We're two years removed from the passing of his wife. Like you said, we see him on the farm. I gotta get them hot. Dude, what a sad yeah. fucking farm. Like, yeah. that, that oh. is like one of the saddest little is it homesteads a farm? I've seen. Yeah, yeah like a shack. Like, dude, it's yeah. a shack and a couple of pigs. It literally looks like something that people build in like Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> seriously. A Minecraft farm is this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah, they're, they, they got some pigs. It's um, it's William Money and his, his two kids. He has a son and a daughter. Um, very small children. Very, they're young. I mean, what? Like both under 10, probably? Yeah. I would say. Yeah. Easy. So, yeah, he, they're just kind of showing them that life is hard. Um, life sucks. Their pigs are sick. And uh, we get the introduction of this Schofield kid <laughs> who is this uh, – he's this young guy. Seems a little hot-tempered kind of. He basically approaches Clint Eastwood and is like, you're William Money, huh? He's like, I've heard about you from my uncles or whatever. They, you used to be a bad son of a bitch, basically. There's um, a hilarious line where he's like, if I ever wanted a partner for killing, that you were the worst. <laughs> yeah. And by worst, I mean the best. best. 
Um, and he kind of, yeah, he lays it out for Clint Eastwood. And here we kind of see how, like, Miss in the West build. And he says that, you know, this prostitute was cut up in this town of Wyoming. They cut her ears off. They cut her breasts off. They cut her nose off. And we her all, fingers. The fingers. Like, we know this is not true. Like, she had slashes and gashes on her face. But so you just see how this, like, legend kind of builds and how things get, you know. People just can't help themselves. Yeah, through little games story. of telephone or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it kind of sets up like, okay, like, you know, you know, whatever. So um, Clint Eastwood, he thinks about it, obviously. You know, that's a shit ton of money. His pigs are dying. They're, they're He's down bad, honestly. Um, and then uh, he, he basically tells the Schofield kid to kind of get lost. He's like, I'm, my wife has cured me of my drinking. My wife has cured me of my wickedness. I've left that, left that life behind me. Um, and the Schofield kid kind of says, well, I'm going to go that way. If you, if you want to come find me, I'm heading on this trail. And he yeah. thinks about it. He does. Because we see, like, with this pig farm, he's literally getting thrown in the mud by the pigs. Like, yeah. that's how symbolically low he's become he's, from being this... He's rolling around in shit. This, yeah. you know, big bad gang leader of uh, gunslingers, you know? Which is implied later on is that it, he must have been, like, the leader of a gang or something. Because he's a very mysterious character, mm-hmm. and you don't get to know very much about him. This movie doesn't just live with exposition of just, I was this guy who did this. It peppers it in here yeah, and there. Yeah, very slightly. And, and it's in moments of regret. Mm-hmm. You know, it's never in a glorified way. Right. Except, and the Schofield kid is the only one who kind of glorifies this Western world, other than a, another writer character that we meet later on. But... The cowboys themselves, the gunslingers, they they know that, you know, how hard this life really is. And, like, the way it's being glamorized is definitely not how it felt right. they were going through. The it. toll that it takes on you. And then you have this kid who, you know, I mean, he says he's been there, done that kind of thing. And he's this badass killer and everything. But, you know, we find out some stuff later I think on. even at this point, uh, an important factor that he keeps bringing up, Clint Eastwood, William Honey, is that he hasn't been drinking in years, in yeah. at least 10 years. And... So all of these thoughts, all of this person that he is doesn't come out anymore because he's not with the bottle. And later in the movie, we see when he finally does change that, who what he's been repressing. And mm-hmm. I think it sets a very good, like from the beginning to let you know that who he is drunk and who he is like not, like because of his wife is two completely different characters. Right, because it's almost like, because on those little things, like the little stories that they pepper in about his past, he always says, like, I don't remember I, I was drunk. Mm-hmm. Like, it's because I was drunk. Like, I have no idea. Yeah, that so. that's a crazy, like, little side caveat of the movie mm-hmm. that he was also, like, this really bad alcoholic on top of being a killer and a yeah. thief and all Like, maybe that. the only reason he was this crazy prolific killer that never got killed himself was because he was wasted all the mm-hmm. time. And, <laughs> you know, like, drunk people, you know, have, you know, no fear or whatever. So, it, it's interesting. And there's jokes of that, like, later they play to Gene Hackman's character because, like, we hear, like, another character and talk about shortly, but almost saying, like, making fun of him that he is always drunk and that mm-hmm. that's why people thought he was clumsy. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. It's like Gene Hackman character is supposed to be opposite of Clint Eastwood's like legend. And that's why they're like, well, later we'll talk, t- talk about it some more, but there's alcohol present in every, like in a lot of aspects in this movie. Yeah, definitely. Very true. Um, so after some consideration, he decides that he's going to have to go I on need this one. Some last, money. Yeah. This one last ride. He's got, he's got kids and hogs to provide mm-hmm. for. <laughs> I got to give these kids a good life. <laughs> I'm not doing so hot right and now. And apparently 500 bucks is going to do it. Yeah. So, I don't know. I'm sure. I'm sure it's sure. a lot of money. I'm like, yeah. I don't know, but um, this brings him to his old partner. Though. Yeah, Ned. Oh, one last point before we get to uh, Ned Morgan Freeman is that. Uh, well, I had already brought it up with the pigs, but Clint Eastwood not being able to get on his horse. Oh either. yeah, you can tell he's That's just really, out of it. Yeah, like that is a nice little character touch. Good, great acting from the horse, right? <laughs> I, I saw that the horse was, was named Rocket in real life. <laughs> oh, was so. it really? Shout out Rocket. <laughs> nice job, Rocket. Um, yeah, like him not being able to get on the horse. And he even says, like, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's like karma. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, I used to uh, curse and whip and, you know, I have my misgivings towards animals. And once again, your mother cured me of that. So, you know, th- it's funny to think that he probably would have, like, socked his horse in the face or yeah, something, like, right? Yeah, like, some <laughs> shit, yeah. <laughs> but the horse is putting him on his ass. Mm-hmm. And, and that must be so symbolic for, like, you said you watched this with your grandpa, right? And that, like, you said your grandpa really liked Clint Eastwood as well, right, Alvaro? Mm-hmm. Imagine them back in the day watching this, seeing the man with no name or 
you know, insert here, Josie Wales or right. whatever, and he can't even get on, on his fucking horse, horse anymore. Who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> I thought you were a badass. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, I just wanted to bring that up. And That's a good point. He, uh, he goes to see his old partner, which mm -hmm. is kind of funny. I feel like this even more leads into the idea that they're not really out of this life. They're more on the fringes waiting to jump back in, is that Ned Logan... His old partner lives within five miles, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. right? It seems so re like, relatively close, yeah. Yeah, because he does tell his kids when he's leaving that, like, if you need to, if you need anything, go see Ned's wife. Mm -hmm. So how far away can they really old live, Old Sally right? Two Trees. Old Sally Two Trees. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one last name. thing I wanted to bring up before we actually progress the story is not just the horse, but seeing him try to shoot. Oh, yeah, he can't hit shit. Yeah. And he gets so frustrated, he goes and grabs a shotgun and just blasts a can. Yeah, he's trying to hit. hit a can, yeah. like, maybe from like, 10 feet away. He does not still have he's it. Like, was, was Pa a killer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even, yeah, even his children are starting to realize who their father was. Yeah, she, what did, she, she, yeah. Did, did Pa used to kill folk? <laughs> yeah, did Pa used to kill folk? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so we're finally here to Morgan Freeman now. And I, I feel like he's maybe a little more reluctant. It seems like it. And in the beginning. does And I feel like does that play into the fact that he does have a wife? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he, he has everything that he, quote unquote, needs. So Yeah, that is that does tend to be a movie trope of mm -hmm. like, hey, I'm happily married now. I don't need to rob banks, kill people, insert here. You right. know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, that probably is, a, is true. Mm -hmm. But after... A little bit of conversation and a little more <laughs> exaggerating. Yeah, exactly. Of even at this point, Clint Eastwood has already exaggerated the story even more than the Schofield kid did. He's like, they cut off her teats. Yeah. He's like, and they left everything but her cunny. Yeah. <laughs> Goddamn. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, and like, yeah, like, because it really seems like Morgan Freeman, he's like not about this at all at first. Like, he's happy. And then after what, like, a, it really seems like a couple minutes of convincing, he's like, all right, fuck it. Let's go. He even says to Clint Eastwood, he's like, well, I guess they deserve it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the guys who have the bounty on their head, like, they have what's coming to them. You see, like, the wheels start turning. It's like, okay, maybe maybe this is, maybe I should do this, but. Yeah. So he's going to, you know, he, as Clint Eastwood is leaving, Morgan Freeman decides, like, you know what? Let's, I'm going to do this with you because I'm your partner and we do this together. And I think it's a nice piece of direction and a really cool shot. So the direction and the cinematography here cinematography here at play is the more curious that Ned gets about joining um, Clint Eastwood's character. You get this shot of Morgan Freeman walking towards the door and then the camera pans up and the rifle is above his head. Yep. And Clint Eastwood tells him like, you still got that Spencer the rifle. Spencer yeah. rifle. <laughs> shoot an eye out a bird in the middle of the sky. Yeah. <laughs> so like even Morgan Freeman, he's like, I'm not down, but if you fuck with me, yeah. I could like hit a bullseye for him. Well, it's moving. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I just thought that was a nice little, yeah, it is. a nice little piece of direction. Yeah, that gun, that gun plays great significance in this movie. So, yeah, and of course, Sally Two Trees is not happy. Fuck no, this. she's not happy. That, even when uh, Clint Eastwood's first character comes in, he talks about how like Sally's never really liked me. She always gives me that dirty look, and then the evil eye. <laughs> and but I think I think it's her knowing who he was and his past and like what he represents coming back and like what she's about to lose. And it also ties into like what. Um, uh, what what kind of Native American she was. They talk about it and how her people aren't trusting. I mm -hmm. did want to bring that up. Uh, I don't think this movie sweeps it under the rug, but it's not a very prominent detail of the movie is like the quote unquote race relations in this mm -hmm. movie. But the fact that they're an interracial couple, Ned and Sally Two Trees, he's uh, African American. She is in, uh, an indigenous person. It's just, it's just it's what Rose saying. She when William Money gets there, she sees the gun, she touches it, she's like, you know, she knows who the he evil is. white man. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, what good is gonna come out of this mission? Because what good has come of these cowboys? Like you know the, what the I mean? Best case Overall, the best case scenario that happens is you murder a couple people. Yeah, literally, that's the best thing that could happen. So, like, is this gonna be a good trip? I don't really know. No, and then even Morgan Freeman's character, you would think it'd be a little more like contentious at the time, like seeing him just being in the town, being a bounty hunter. Um, he's not really, that's not really ever brought up that much until I guess the way that Ned's story ends. Yeah. You could say, you could say that be like, Oh, well it's a, it's a race thing, but he's not really treated in any negative way in this movie. You no, know what I yeah. mean? Which you, I thought was, you don't get an overbearance of race stuff. Like pretty that. progressive for the nineties. Yeah. Right? There's only, there's only one uh, race thing that I think, 
that they could have treated him that way if it were to be a racism thing, and it's how they treat Asian Americans. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, like, it seems that they treat Asian Americans worse because of, like, the railroad than they were... In this movie, than they were treating Morgan Freeman's character. Yeah, True. so this movie has that stuff on the fringes, but it it's really not about that it's overall. It's not the main focus, yeah. But I just think because it's Clint Eastwood and he's so wrapped up in this Western world that he's he has all these pieces in there because he knows that this is how this time History. was in a non-glamorizing inside, like, yeah. way. He knows the insides of it. Insides and outs of westerns like nobody else. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like this at, at this time, like this is his sixteenth movie that he directed. <laughs> which like at that like that's ninety two. So even from them, like impressive. That's like, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So for him to just have this grip on how to throw all this stuff in and it's just like there's something there, there's something there, there's something there. Even if it's not being brought to the forefront it's and like there. hitting you over the head, it's there for you to digest. And it, I wonder you know? if he censored that a bit from the original story. I wonder if in the original story, you know, there's more of those aspects? I actually... Maybe. Uh, I mean, I would have to I look was, into... I was reading that he actually pretty much changed nothing okay. from the screenplay except the title card in the beginning and the end, whereas originally in the screenplay was a voiceover. Oh, that's and, probably better than and it he, was. Exactly. Because even, like, the, the text is like, it is what it is. I know I know you said it kind of... It's not the best. And I'm like, I agree. Um, yeah. It is what it is. But I do think that's better than a voiceover, so... So when you sure. were talking about um, the guy... Not wanting as much violence, he rewrote it with more violence. Though that wasn't Clint Eastwood. I, that uh, was not Clint Eastwood changing that. No, he, it original. was when he was originally. I don't know if he rewrote the screenplay or when he was writing it. He, he just kind of like in the middle. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, I think that's just testament to the, the kind of director that Clint Eastwood is. Is like, okay, the script is ready. This is the script we're going yeah. with. Yeah, I know that they changed one line later on with Richard Harris's character. It was literally just removing like one or two words from the sentence. So that the cadence of it sounded a little bit better, sounded better, yeah. But other than that, Clint Eastwood's like, "Let's go!" Yeah, yeah like we're rolling like, with the script. Know, like you can tell, like Francis Ford Coppola loved it, Clint Eastwood loved it. Like it, it, it's a good ass script. So. Those are two huge names yeah. to yeah. be interested like, in the same script. Real. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, back to Sally Two Trees. Yeah. And Morgan Freeman. Yeah. So he, he, I find it crazy that he doesn't even say anything to her when he's leaving. No, he, he just like kind of tips the cap. Yep. I'm like, all right, later. This Take is care of everything. Like, that's like what Clint Eastwood basically did. He's like, all right, I'll be back in two weeks, a couple weeks. Good luck. You know what I mean? Like the men in those times didn't, they don't give a shit. They just leave. Like they just do whatever they want to do. <laughs> like it's kind of crazy. I think it comes from, I, I guess in a way being like hardened and I'm sure them as kids was even worse. That, that type of, like, precedent to set. To, like, you have to be able to learn how to survive. But the kid is probably at most eight, you know. So it, it's it's just weird to see. And then, yeah, it's your wife, but he's like, see you later. Yeah, it's a tough <laughs> ass life, dude. Tough shit. Um, and then, yeah, so they take off. And I think I think it kind of flips back to the town of Big Whiskey. And we see that the thaw has happened. And then mm. um, the two cowboys come back with the horses, right? And they're giving him to Skinny, you know, the pimp. And um, when they're doing this, uh, all the prostitutes come out and start throwing uh, horse shit at them. <laughs> I, th- I just think it's such a funny scene. They're like, get the fuck out of our town. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then the... Uh, it's interesting. The, the quote unquote whores have kind of unionized yeah. at this point. You they know have. what I mean? They're yeah. like, fuck skinny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, they don't give a shit. It's also because we know that the sheriff isn't really doing anything to actually... Like, they, yeah. they, they expected more out of him. They're like, he's not going to take care of it. So we have to basically... I don't know, try to humiliate them in any way. Because, I mean, at this point, how much power do women have, and especially women in a, a, in a whorehouse, right? But obviously we see that they, honestly, they do, because they yeah. have money, and that's that's how the Wild West was. If money there was money to world. be made, yeah, there, mm-hmm. anything could be done. It's interesting that you bring that up about, like, how much power could they really have, because um, taking it back to the first scene with the, the cutting of the face and all of that, um, Gene Hackman lets the cowboys off like as pretty much easy pretty much as easy as you could be let go um and he tells what's her name uh the ma- the Stra- i would say like alice? strawberry alice he tells her it's not like these are like bad guys mm. they're not tramps they're not low lowlifes they're just a couple of boys or whatever right and he was like it would be different and then she cuts him off and it's like if they were whores mm-hmm. and yeah, yeah, like that's exactly, exactly that's what he means. He's he says it by not saying anything. He just mm-hmm. lets it sit. Like, well, yes, you are correct. Yeah, that is why we're gonna let these guys go, and that's why we're not gonna give you equal justice for 
you know, this atrocity basically yeah. that takes place. And so, so yeah, you have the scene, they bring the horses back and then the one who actually didn't cut up, um, what's her name? Delilah. Uh, he says that he brought his best horse to give to her and they're kind of like, no, fuck you, fuck off. And then this is a very important part of the story. I feel like, because this is where they reveal that they have a bounty out for them, yeah. that they have a thousand dollars and that there's a bounty out. And this word gets a little bill. And this basically spirals the rest of the movie, kind of. I think a good thing to know, too, right after we find out that they have the money, we also find out that they don't really have the money, which sets in a danger and it's president on its own. Because she's like, well, we don't have a thousand. She's like, well, you're not yet. Because she has like three, three, three fifteen, I think, and like two sixty. So they have like five hundred bucks. And then yeah. like when when they come to collect and they find out you don't have the rest of it, they're like, they're going to what do you think they'll do to you? Which is I think Gene Hackman's is like main reason why he doesn't want all these people coming in even though we did know they not, not have the money um, i really don't remember it's it's touched upon that they have a certain amount but, it's maybe but not i don't know the dollars. exact dollar amount that makes sense. but what ro is saying is like collectively pulling their money together one of them's like i have 300 bucks yeah i know one of them says for sure that, that she has 85 dollars yeah i remember that so they're pulling together <laughs> they're go funding. Yeah, go, go fund me. Yeah. yeah, they're go fund me this bounty. <laughs> and yeah. I didn't know what to call it outside of go funding me. I was like, I don't know. That sounds kind of weird. Uh, a fundraiser. Yeah. So yeah. So that kind of sets up. And little Bill's kind of aware that we might have some people kind of come into this town, and he seems like a guy that doesn't want any fucking trouble. Can we talk about Little Bill's house? I was just about to go there because he doesn't want any trouble because all this guy wants to do is build his damn house. Do you feel like at this point you're still on Little Bill's not? I don't know about saying side, but that I I don't think I I did not feel as negatively about him in this part of the movie as I did later on. I do think that he still takes more bad turns. So. I think it's because I and th I think this is why you cast someone like Gene Hackman who's so likable, right? Because not like I was con like justifying how. He ha he mishandled the situation, but I did kind of think like, well, he is the sheriff and, you know, justice doesn't necessarily mean revenge. Mm -hmm. So when Strawberry Alice is like, you're not going to whip him, you're not going to hang him. He's like, haven't you seen enough bloodshed for one night? Right. And then it kind of snaps you back into the reality of the situation of like getting even is not normally the answer. No, you know what I mean? It just not. causes more chaos and awfulness, you exactly. know, but so I feel like that sets you up in a way where you're like, okay, I could, I guess I can see why he's not going to do this because an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Right. right. But then I still feel up to this point where you see him building his house and he becomes aware of the situation that's building. You still kind of feel as if he could make the right choice in the future or like, okay, where is this guy's story going to go? He's so, uh, he's so, he's in such a gray area because yeah. at the, like at the same time, like you said, like is murdering these people the right answer? Like, I is mean, this probably not yeah, right? Like yeah. in the grand scheme of things, like I don't probably not. I don't think so. But at the same time, like this is the wild west. Like this is how it was. And you either respect the law of the town or you go against it. And That's it is what it is. Overlaying theme of the movie too. We get a line end up later that basically that what you guys are talking about, like is killing them equal to like, what does that solve really? And obviously we're watching this as, 2021 we're looking at a woman get cut because she laughed at a guy because of his dick size 22 2022 sorry <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah um and it, uh, it's obviously like well yeah you start to feel for the, the women obviously more because you know that there's not going to be any justice justice being done but there's also what you're talking about the other side is like well gene hackman has a point and be like what is more blood what does that fix it just spills more blood i mean not to get too much into like criminal justice reform yeah, and stuff yeah. like that but how code. is yeah <laughs> how is killing somebody like doesn't that kind of doesn't absolve them of their crime it's just like okay well now you don't have to deal with the punishment or the consequences of the situation you created exactly you know it's like getting up. out i don't want to say getting out easy but almost yeah when almost you're dead is. like problem solved i don't yeah. have to worry about that anymore exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, so, so yeah, that whole, that shit happens and yeah, little Bill's aware of everything and he's building his house and, and he just wants a simple life. He too. does. He's like, like, I want to sit here. He's building a porch as well, mm -hmm. right on top of his house. And he's talking about, I want to sit here and drink my coffee and smoke my pipe and watch the sunset. Yep, exactly. Like he just wants to kind of fade off into the, to the end of his life. It seems like. So, um, I think the, I think the movie cuts back to Ned and Mr. Money while they're, you know, 
trying to meet up with the Schofield kid and somebody There's takes some, some beautiful shots. Absolutely. Sorry, I don't want to cut you in off. the wheat. Like when they're in the wheat the fields wheat. and yeah. like oh the golden hour God. shots in this movie. Ooh, Mwah, chef's kiss. It's so good. That, yeah, that is one of the things. The cinematography of this movie alone is off the chain. Uh, off the chain. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we cut back to them and they're just kind of they're they're traveling. You know, we get those. Those are your traditional Western shots. Two guys on a horse, long shots. Mm -hmm. It's gorgeous. And somebody starts shooting at them. They get they start getting shot at. They're like, "What the fuck is going on? Like, what's going on?" And they find out that it's a Schofield kid, and they're like, "Why the fuck are you shooting at us?" And Ned basically keeps pressing this kid, like, "What the hell? Like, can you see?" And we kind of find out that this, this kid can't fucking see. <laughs> <laughs> it just adds to the whole his own myth building. Mm -hmm. Like, I've killed five people, but I can't even fucking see in yeah. front of me. Like, so what? It, what is really going on here with the Schofield kid? I think it's a very cool point because, like, this character is both literally and like metaphorically like short-sighted yeah you know what i mean yeah. like actually i just think that's a cool little little thing um i was telling you guys off the pod that i feel like every character besides ned william money and little bill are all archetypes mm -hmm. right of what you would normally expect in, in a, a western. western and the schofield kid being i guess I wouldn't say so similar to Clint Eastwood when he was young, but just that type of character. Yeah, the, right? I, I'm out here looking for blood. Like, I want action. I want to ask you, in like the, I don't, not to put you on the spot here, like on the historian level, but Clint Eastwood has always kind of played like an, a different version of a Western character than someone like John Wayne or oh, anyone 100%. else, right? Yeah. It's always been like the, the tall stranger with no name, right? Yeah, John, he's very yeah. quiet. Exactly. Like, he, he's a guy that rolls up into town. Nobody knows who he is, and he just kind of gets in, something happens, and he gets yeah. involved in it. I mean, not every Western hero is as quiet and stoic no. as Clint Eastwood. John right? Wayne That's is, kind of his own John thing. John Wayne talks a lot. Like, yeah. John Wayne is all about speed. Like, that fucker loves to talk. And then you have <laughs> Clint up a scene. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, and that's that's what a lot of people love about those movies is his, his monologues and his and that kind of stuff. But then you have Clint Eastwood, who's about action. The, he, he's an action man. The Schofield kid actually reminds me, and I know a lot of people don't love this movie, but this is a Western that's deep to me, and I, I've loved it my whole life, is Young Guns. Yeah, I was going to say yeah, that. Yeah, right? <laughs> that he's like a Will, like a Billy the Kid ripoff. Mm -hmm. You exactly. know what I mean? Where he's, he's like, reckless. oh, I'm this guy, and I've done this, and I've even stabbed a guy, and, you know, I, I'm a killer. I'm a cold-blooded killer, just like you. It, it almost kind of plays into the whole, like, like, this is not just a Western, like, kind of trope or idea, but it's, like, the people who stay silent are usually the people who are actually about it. Yeah. And the people that want to talk about everything they've done are usually the people that really haven't done shit. You know what I mean? So, I think it kind of plays into that character type. It's good. We get a good bit of comedy right here, too. This movie is very funny. Yeah, I think so, too. Right? I think this movie's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's got a lot of humor in it. And, like, well, yeah, like, as you said, we find out that the Schofield kid can't even see. He yeah. needs some spectacles, as yeah. they say. That he can't see, like, what, 50 to 100 yards in front like of anything him? anything over, yeah, like 50 yards he can't see. And we get this little bit where, like, Morgan Freeman's like, do you see that hawk up there? And he's like, yeah, I see. He's like, there ain't no damn hawk up there, boy. <laughs> 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 or uh, the Schofield kid steals his canteen, mm -hmm. throws it on the ground, and he shoots it, like, three times yeah, from five feet away. That. He's like, I can see that. He's like, we ain't going to be shooting no damn canteens. <laughs> <laughs> this movie is really funny, and this movie's quick too. Like, there's a lot of stuff that I think you could almost just kind of miss. It just, it just rolls. I think it's hilarious that two out of three people in this party can't aim or shoot anymore, yeah. right? So it's like Morgan Freeman is kind of, I wouldn't say the most important one, but like in an action sense, you would assume that Morgan Freeman's going to kind of carry the load. There, I was going to say know? you kind of assume that he's going to be the one that does the deed. You, yeah, you know, like he's their shooter, so. He's got the... the other, one guy can't see. One guy's 90 years old. <laughs> <laughs> can't even fucking get on his yeah. horse. <laughs> like. Morgan Freeman seems to be the only one who still has, like, the willingness and the ability to actually get this job done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think another small bit of humor. It's their first night, you know, sleeping. And they've been gone, what, maybe half a day or a full day yeah, at maybe. that. And... Clint Eastwood makes this little joke about like, man, I'm sure going to miss my bed. I got used to sleeping in a bed. Morgan Freeman's character is already making these jokes about I'm going to miss more than my bed. <laughs> He's right? a horny bastard. Yeah, why is it? <laughs> Morgan Freeman is exceptionally horny in this movie. <laughs> I don't know, man. He's just about it. Yeah, uh, he's like, I. you know why I don't miss shooting guns? Sex. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. And um, he also apologizes for making such a crude comment because... 
you know, Clint Eastwood like, oh, doesn't have his wife dead. anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I, he's like, you don't have to apologize, but yeah, I miss her a lot. Yeah. Right. And then we kind of, then we just kind of get them like reflecting on some of their old gang life, like some of the shit that happened. And Clint Eastwood kind of talks about. I know what you said. You like that line about the remember that kid that I shot in the mouth. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I shot a kid in the mouth, and his teeth, his teeth came blown out the back of his head. <laughs> Dude, Jesus for, Christ, yeah, he didn't deserve that. <laughs> He's like, at least, and then what do you say? He's like, at least not that I can remember once I was sober. Yeah, like, he's like, he didn't do anything to deserve that. At least, I, yeah, I couldn't remember when I was sober. And he like, tells him, he's like, but you're not like that anymore. It's yeah. okay. People change. Yeah, people, yeah. people change. <laughs> and then we kind of get, and then, yeah, like, uh, the school field kid is kind of like, well, I killed five people and, like, blah, 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 blah. And, like, he proudly admits that he stabbed a Mexican. Yeah. Like, yeah. One, one of them was a Mexican. He came at me with a knife. <laughs> like, That's worth two. <laughs> <laughs> And then it's just like, and then I, what I what I really think is interesting is you get hit the Schofield kids like almost obsession with um, William Money's past life and like all these like stories that he's heard. He's like, "There's no way you did that." My uncle said that you you were in this tight situation with these two guys and you just like whipped out your guns and killed them and everything. And Clint Eastwood doesn't really acknowledge it, right? And then the next morning we get Ned. And he comes up to um, William Money and he says, "Wasn't it three guys?" And he's like, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Like, kind of thing. Like, so the stories that people know aren't even as grand as happened. the truth. Yes. Whereas almost everybody else in this story is they make up these lies, and they're not truthful at all. So it's like this weird, like, juxtaposition between these, all these stories are not true, but, you know what I mean? Like, kind of flip-flop them. Yeah, like, the truth is undersold. The the false story oh, is oversold. oversold. Yeah, yeah, it's I love it. Like I, it's so it's such good writing. I think and the character development. I think it's just really interesting. The Schofield kid is like a perfect representation of like the newcomers to the genre thinking you'd want to be a legendary killer. And I think like it does a really good job of. Um, cause there's another character we're gonna get to shortly. We're gonna get to that right now after this point. That like these two are almost like audience reception to western, and they yeah. and they um they embody those characters in the story. And then we end up seeing, at the end, just the way that they react to certain things that is almost Clint Eastwood's, like, this is what I think is wrong with Westerns, or what the people who like Westerns, or yeah. whatever it might be, the exact message, but I think... You know how I was saying that I, f- I kind of saw the Schofield kid as, like, a Billy the Kid type of character mm-hmm. and like, Young Guns? Mm-hmm. And I said, P- I know a lot of people don't like that movie. I, I mean, like that movie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty fire, but I think maybe because what we were mentioning earlier is that, like... You can't really just do the same thing, and then Young Guns is kind of just that same thing. It is thing, the same thing, yeah. Right? But anyways, I just wanted to talk about it. It's Young almost kind of how, like, Tombstone's, like, kind of the same thing. Yeah, you know right? I mean? And maybe that's why these movies are kind of like, eh, that's like, why, like, okay. Like, Tombstone's cool, but it's not up there with yeah. some of the greats. I feel like it's if you haven't seen a bunch of them, and that's the first one you see, every, you go, that's That's tiny. everybody's like, oh, have you seen Tombstone? Tombstone it's like, yeah. well, yeah, but... Have you seen this from the 1930s? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> have you seen Downhill Ride? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John Ford did that 60 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Rio Grande, Rio Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And then, uh, so what happens next? We get the introduction of... Billy? English Bob, Dude, what is Bob? My favorite character? Billy. I don't know. I said Billy. Oh, because you said Billy, Billy the, the kid. Yeah, you know, Billy the kid. Billy. <laughs> English Billy. English Billy. Old baby Billy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we get English Bob, and this is what a, a fantastic character. performance. Yes. Richard Harris. Um, if you are not aware of Richard Harris, the way you would recognize him is he was the original Dumbledore. Num- so numero if, uno Dumbledore, yep. Yeah. Um, it took me a while when I was watching it the first time. I was like, I know this. Couldn't, I know him from somewhere. Yeah. I couldn't place it. And then I looked him up and I was like, it's Dumbledore. Yeah. I was so excited. <laughs> um, yeah, he plays English Bob, who is another one of these archetypes, mm-hmm. right? Um, he's like a bounty hunter. It he's seems hilarious, like. he's too. He's funny. Well, I, I wouldn't even give him the credit of being a bounty hunter. Yeah, he's more of enough. a paid killer yeah. to, and I quote, kill off Chinamen. <laughs> yeah, yeah right? It's like he's killing dudes who work for the railroad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yikes! I, I Scummy. Think this is one of the characters I provided to you talking about where it's really funny for you two, and it's just this whole bit that he has talking about why England is better, why England, like why royalty and kings are better than presidents, and he just keeps going on. And I don't on. mean to give <laughs> offense. Yeah, yeah. I don't. He's like, he's like, I know you keep saying you don't mean to give offense, but you're giving a lot of offense. <laughs> yeah. Is what the guy tells him. It's just great. You get yeah. He's riding in the train car, and you can. He's just he's pestering everybody. He's just bothering people, and he's sitting there so pompous reading this newspaper. And you can tell he's egging this guy on to kind of see how this guy reacts. And the dude next to him is like, 
this is English Bob. Like, he's baiting you to grab your gun so he can blow your head off right here, right now. Like, relax kind of thing. I think it's funny that he calls him this dude is English Bob. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this dude. <laughs> and that's crazy to think already because I thought about it after is that they know the legend of English Bob. Mm-hmm. They are they are also listeners of the legends that people have told of these cow of I guess bounty hunters, not cowboys. But and later we find out that it's this not. I love the idea of in westerns that if you were somebody, you people would know who you are, mm-hmm. like a state away, or even if you're from a different country. Yep. Like I've heard tale of English Bob. Like you got English Bob. You got Buffalo Billy. You got Billy the Kid. You got Little Bill. Like all these people got these nicknames, and you know that those nicknames supposedly come with this big myth behind them. Yeah, and even English Bob, he's just another one of these cowboys who his story is probably bigger than he actually is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But he's also he's he is dangerous. But he is also not as dangerous as some of the other men that are in this right, world. Right. He's not the biggest uh, fish in the tank <laughs> by exactly. a long shot. Because we do get, because then after this, the dude that they're kind of beefing with in the train, they, they have a shoot off out, outside some of the pheasants. train, some pheasants, and who can shoot the most pheasants? And he's a good shot. So we can see, all right, you know, he maybe hits eight this out of ten, true. right? He hits eight, the other dude hits one, he gets paid whatever, seven bucks or seven, whatever the hell it Baller. is. Baller. Yeah, so this is cool. I really like that scene. It reminds me of Red Dead Redemption, like a little mini game or That's something. That's a very good scene like it's one of my the english bob stuff is very good i think so too <laughs> I, I think so another too. interesting thing we get is the passenger he's with which is his biographer oh yeah 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 um, we're not done with this scene the, yeah what is his name w.w w. bochamps yeah, bochamps God. he's a biographer and he's a what you're talking mm-hmm. about i'm yeah i want i wanted to make sure we didn't forget to bring that back up but if the schofield kid is is a kid watching movies and trying to be like western stars Bo Champs is like these writers who writer. exaggerate these stories and they love the murder and the bloodshed. Kind of reminds me of like Al Pacino, be like, oh, all the shooting. I love this stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Such a lot of time. Yeah. And I think it, it, it always goes back to a lot of these movies do it capitalism, man, and just about how you're going to glamorize a story because it's going to sell. Yeah. And yeah. it, people are going to just like recognize them, like, that's English Bob, and think of these high stories of a person. And something I thought was really funny is that. All of them have a nickname except William Honey, yeah. and he's like the baddest of the bad. Like you know his name. He don't need a nickname. He don't need, yeah. What I what, since we're talking about names, I did want to touch on this. I think it's really cool. I don't know if it was on purpose. I, I would like to think that it is, but obviously Clint Eastwood is famous for being the man with no name. You know, in a lot of his movies. And in this movie, he has a name, and his last name is literally Money. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like he's literally the thing that everybody is after, and the you know, the gravitational force of this whole story. I, I just think it's an interesting touch. Yeah. It's a nice, nice piece of uh, writing right yeah, there. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so English Bob gets to the town finally. Yeah, because he, he wants a bounty. And he's, like, he's, he's waxing in the money. more poetically about how England is just better. <laughs> yeah. He has this hilarious line about, like, of course you would shoot a president, but you would never shoot a king or a queen. Like, you could point your gun at a queen, and your hand would shake, and yeah. you wouldn't even be able to pull the trigger because you'd be in such of the majesty's <laughs> royalty but why not shoot a president yeah why not shoot a president and the president that they're talking about is james garfield and this is a callback for me because when i was in like somewhere between third and sixth grade we did a report on presidents and i had james garfield oh really so, and i was like damn i got a president who got shot <laughs> 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 that was literally the most interesting thing about him is that he got shot fair enough <laughs> So yeah, he's in the town and what he's getting his haircut and he's just bothering he's people, shaved. talking shit. And then uh, little Bill. and he's well, telling stories. I guess the fact that as he's coming into the town, we see that there's no guns allowed. In this oh, place. there is a sign. There is a yes. sign up, and then I think that becomes the big issue. So whenever anybody comes in and has their guns, doesn't give them up, they go and tell the sheriff, "Hey, mm-hmm. yo, there's somebody here or two cowboys here with their guns," and he goes and deals with it. So yeah, then you get all the. Uh, like, all the little deputies kind of get ready and start loading up their guns. And I like the scene where the dude with one arm reloads all his weapons because I don't trust anybody to load my shit. <laughs> like, yeah. You know I mean? Or the, the the one dude saying, he's like, I'd rather be shot when it's cold. <laughs> or yeah, when it's hot yeah, versus really when it's cold. Funny. Because, it hurt more. Yeah, it hurts more when it's cold. You <laughs> know, when you hit your thumb and it's the cold. That's the funny part. Yeah. That's, like, the funny <laughs> stuff for sure. Like, what? Like, he's it, like, why it, you got one arm and you got three guns, right? <laughs> English Bob also has, like, this funny, I can't remember specifically, um... When when the guy tries to get him to give up his guns at first, the deputy, the deputy, because he tells him, he's like, oh, this isn't this isn't a gun for shooting. It's like for lizards, I think he tells him. <laughs> for snakes or lizards. Because yeah, yeah, that's like what that. they, it comes back twice again, like thinking like, I guess they would carry guns just to shoot lizards and snakes. Yeah, for It was just like a smaller one. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
But th- this little segment, like these little like fifteens, like so funny. There's just a lot of back and forth, and I thought I, I thought that was really funny. Mm-hmm. The the cold getting that shot. Shit, the cold. <laughs> you hit your thumb. It's way worse. <laughs> I think you're getting shot. That shit going to hurt no matter what, my guy. <laughs> and even also like when he's like rearming the gun. Because he's like, I don't trust anybody yeah. loading my gun. He's like, exactly. come on, man. He's like, I haven't done <laughs> it's everything. It's so fucking funny. Um, this is where Little Bill really... This is where we, we get our see true, who he is. Our true colors of yeah. Little Bill. Because then uh, as soon as... Um, as soon as uh, English, English Bob, Bob walks out of the, you know, the barber... He got shock into his face. All the deputies are there, and so is Little Bill. And we can see that they know each other. Yes. They do have a history. And he says, which has got to be one of the funniest lines in the movie, I'll be shitting fried eggs. <laughs> yeah, English Bob. Because he's scared that he just ran into yeah, Little he's Bill like, again. Oh, fuck. Yes. So, like, obviously, like, okay, like, these guys do know each other, and there's maybe some sort of truth to something, but um, Little Bill just kind of, he's like, give me your fucking guns. This you know is where I mean? he snaps. He yeah. He's totally unhinged in this moment. Because this is what he's been waiting for to happen is these rough and tough whoever trying to come and collect a bounty. And it's like what Rose said it. earlier. This is what he. He's been trying to avoid this particular thing from happening exactly. because he just wants to chill and right. build his house. And we find out that he's left a life of crime behind and he is arguably just as bad or worse than William Money. Mm-hmm. And uh, he kind of, it, it's just interesting with Westerns in that time, you could like be a murderer, a thief, whatever, go two towns over and be like, hey, I'm the sheriff now. Yeah, exactly. And it's That's probably, what I was say. and I'm sure some of them were people lying and changing their identities, maybe taking the name of someone they killed, or. I've heard also that they would make people the sheriffs because they knew how criminals Thought. would think and how, to, like, this is what criminals do. This is where they would hide. So then it's like, well, why not just have a criminal be yeah. the sheriff? I'm like, who's to stop a criminal from coming and killing the sheriff and then just becoming the sheriff? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? There yeah. ain't no fucking laws. That's what I was going to say because you guys brought up how that's the first time that we get that somebody recognizes Little, Little Bill. Bill for mm-hmm. being a, an outlaw, not for being a sheriff. Right. Yeah. And we, again, get, like, what we would see from, I guess, money if he was living a good life, that the house would be well built and stuff. So, Gene Hackman's character, Little Bill, is like the it's it working out. He doesn't have a family, but it's him being able to chill after being such a bad outlaw. But it, it's always been funny to me that in Westerns, the outlaw ends up being the sheriff. Mm-hmm. I and mean, in this one, we find out that he's probably he's um, English Bob is scared of Little Bill. So, obviously, like you said, he's either equal. Or just as bad as William Money. <laughs> yeah. And he's the sheriff. What I also kind of think is, do you think he's scared of him because maybe he's a bad motherfucker or because he actually knows the truth about him? You know what I mean? I think both. both. Yeah, yeah, probably. I so. think the truth is that little Bill's a bad motherfucker. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I'm not, so yeah. So. Or I'm not as bad. Yeah. And the idea that Bo Champs is writing this biography about English Bob and that Little Bill knows the truth, knows yeah. that truth of like, I was there. That didn't happen. Mm-hmm. We literally get that line that's later a, yeah, on in the movie. But, but I don't want to skip over this no. because this is just <laughs> this an is awesome this scene. This is a great scene. Yeah. Little Bill finally snaps. And I, he get, he delivers one of the greatest lines I've ever heard in cinema. You dare talk about the Queen of England on Independence Day? And then he Damn. socks him. He punches off the face. He falls off the, the fucking, like, porch. America. And I, yeah. Yeah. USA. USA. And I just love it because, like, the first thing he says to English Bob is, like, oh, you still out here, like, talking about the fucking queen and stuff yeah. like that? Like, you know he's been doing it for forever. Yeah, and he tells him, he's like, I know you think I'm kicking you right now. Yeah. He's like, but I'm talking to you. And yeah. he kicks him in the face twice. He just keeps kicking and him he, all over he gives town. a warning that, like, if any outlaw comes here... If, you know, spread the word that, like, anybody who comes to this town, this is what's going to happen yep. to them. And uh, I would not want that to happen to me. No. So if I was one of these outlaws, I probably would be like, okay, fuck. Yeah. English Bob got fucked up because English Bob is a, is a someone, mm-hmm. right? We get Bochamp pissing himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah that <laughs> that is classic. Because <laughs> he reaches for the book, right? Yeah, yeah. he's like, yeah. it's just books. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I also don't want to skip over this line either is when uh, English Bob sees Little Bill and he tells him, oh, I thought you were dead, that you fell off your mm-hmm. horse drunk and broke your bloody neck. He's like, I thought I was dead, but I woke up in Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> I was just in Nebraska. Like, it's so good, dude. So funny. So, yeah, uh, Little Bill beats the shit out of English Bob and he, he locks him up. He throws him in jail. And then... Um, you get Bo Champs kind of has this, he starts talking a little bill and they kind of open up with each other and, uh, we kind of find out some truth about English Bill and maybe he is Bob. Oh, sorry. Bob Bill. Bobby Bill. <laughs> I, I, I think it starts interestingly, interestingly because um, he's telling him he's writing about the Duke of Death and he's like the duck, the duck of death, the duck of death. And he keeps saying, you can just keep 
thinking it's because he can't read, but he's obviously trying to get at a point, and then later we find out why he, he's the he thinks he's the duck of death. Be like, well, let me tell you why this story that you re- I was there, and that's not what happened. Gene Hackman has some powerful moments in in this, this segment is, of the this movie. Is a very this is like the little right Bill segment of yeah, the movie. It is. Um, yeah, like he insists on like he's like the Duke, and he's like no. The, the duck. duck. Like, because, yeah, this guy's a fucking duck. He's no dude. So he kind of, yeah, he tells him about the story that happened and how he, you know, shot down this other famous gunslinger or whatever. And then Little Bill reveals the truth on how, no, they're like, that's not how it happened. English Bob was actually just fucked up. And this dude tried to draw on him and he shot himself in the foot. And then his gun exploded in his hand. And then English Bob walked up to him, drunk as fucking shot him in the face. Like. He's no gunslinger, like... I think it was in the liver, actually. Oh, which yeah. Which is probably yeah, more it's painful, worse. too. Like, it's <laughs> not even... A, like, you can't even... Yeah, exactly. This is one of my favorite lines, because he goes, he's like... Two pistol, whatever doesn't pistol even. Pete, he's like, he's like, wasn't even called two pistol because he had two pistols. It's only that his dick was so big, so <laughs> like, he's like, maybe it was he bigger should've... than the barrel of his gun. <laughs> like, maybe he should have carried two guns. <laughs> yeah. I feel like this. <laughs> Lots of dick jokes in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> Why is this movie oh, yeah. so funny? I don't know. It doesn't deserve to be this. It funny. shouldn't be, it shouldn't but be, it is. But, it, but it's it's like the right amount, you know, and. Because maybe a little more, and it and it takes it off the wheels of how serious it can get. But it's just the right amount of. I don't even know if it's purposely being funny. It's just the fact that this was the life that it would have been. Yeah. Always trying to trump each other. Always trying to be funny. Then we've brought this up in a few podcasts now, but about movies being so good when it's deep and got the message, and it's got the the action, the fun, the That's the popcorn a, and the and the the you know the dessert and the vegetables. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like okay, I'm getting a full That's course a good meal fucking here. movie. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. Um. This scene, I feel like, really adds to the deconstructing of, like, Western mm-hmm. mythos mm-hmm. and stuff like that, right? Because even Bill, who is tr- who's left that life behind because, you know, he's trying to chill now and he wants to live the good life, even he's not, like, glamorizing it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like the dick joke. That guy didn't have two guns. He just had a giant dick. <laughs> yeah. Like, or uh, I was there when that happened. That guy shot himself in the foot mm-hmm. and gave little... Uh, Gave Bob, like, three or four chances to shoot him, yeah, right? he's getting mm-hmm. missing, yeah. Yeah, and there's this cool scene, or this cool sub-story about, like, how fast can you draw a pistol, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And how, like, this is as fast as I can do it while still being able to aim. And that so many people who were outlaws and gunslingers and stuff like that, like, so many of them died because they weren't cool and calm under the pressure. They just like, react. Yeah, they shoot their foot off, or... Uh, or they pull too fast and miss, or... Yeah, the, the guy with the... The two pistols or whatever that the gun that he did have, even when he had Bob in his in his sights and could have t- taken him out, that the gun jammed and it was because that gun was commonly a yeah, gun that jammed. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it's like that would happen all the time with those guns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Bochamp is just like eating this he's shit. Like, up. What the fuck? And then you kind of see like you just he's kind of a hoe himself. Like he's just like all right, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna ride with you now. He shifts to, like I wonder because he was like having working with the publication. I just think it's funny how he just shifted to be like no. Nah, Fuck the Duke of Death. Like, I'm going to write about this guy who's cooler than him. Again, just trying to sell more articles for whatever it is. His own publishing company or whatever mm-hmm. it is. And then, yeah, and then you get that good scene where, that good part of the scene where little Bill is the like. The scene is so good. There's so many parts I, of I know. it. He's like, he basically pulls out his gun and gives it to Bochamps and is like, kill me. Take little, take uh, English Bob and you guys can write off. It's like, first you got to cock it. Yeah. And then he's like, and then you got to point it, you got to aim. And then he's like, pull the trigger. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. And then he's like, it's not as easy to kill a man as you think. Right. And then I, it's just a classic Gene Hackman moment that he has in all of his movies where he's like, that gun's hot, ain't it? <laughs> 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 and he just gives his evil little laugh, you know? <laughs> and then he's like, you can't do it. He's like, you're kind of a pussy. He's like, why don't you give it to English Bob? This it, is so good. Mm-hmm. It's such good acting because it, the first time he tells him, he's like, give it to him very softly. And then. You know, Bochamps and Bob are looking at each other, and what we miss, what we missed on right now, is that when Bochamps has the gun and he's pointing it, English Bob like wakes up out of his mm-hmm. like sleep. He's like, "What the hell like, is oh, going shit. on?" Like, "Oh, sh- this is Little Bill. This is why I didn't want to be in this situation." But when Bochamps is thinking about giving the gun to Bob, uh, Bill tells him he's like, "Give it to him very softly," and then he's like, "Give it to him." Like, because he's like, I to, want to shoot him. Yeah. So he wants him to grab the gun and he wants him to take aim because he wants to blast him. He wants to waste a fool. Yeah. But in English, Bob walks up very slowly and thinks about it and he doesn't. And little Bill, but what, he says something like along the lines of like, it's a good thing that you didn't. He's like, because yeah. I wanted to. But you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. damn. I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay. So then, uh, yeah, you have uh, little Bill and then the writer end up going back to his house now, I think, right? Yeah. And you get to see how shitty <laughs> Little Bill's house really is. One thing this guy can't do is build a house. Yeah. 
the you get this good shot where it's like looking at them and the whole house is slanted like it's all off center and <laughs> there's so many fucking leaks coming through the ceiling yeah. and then I, I know you want to talk about it the line that Bojamp says oh because he just brings up to him that they should hang the the carpenter <laughs> yeah. and he and, and it's just funny that Gene Hackman gives him this like look like almost like like I I, I could hang you right now for yeah. saying and then that, he says know? it again. Yeah. He like doubles down on the joke. He's like, yeah, I said like, you know, hang the carpenter. Ha ha. (laughs) Motherfucker. (laughs) He's like, no, I understood you. I just can't believe like, yeah. And I'm contemplating if I should blast you right now. (laughs) And that's the running joke is that uh, little Bill's a terrible carpenter. He might be a good sheriff, might be a good outlaw. He's a terrible carpenter. (laughs) (laughs) Just little character details, you know, that help fill out the world. Yeah. Honestly. Um, And I, I, this is the night where the trio rides into town too. Um, while the, I think so, right? Uh, I, yes. I Cause it's so. raining and I wanted to talk about this, that mm-hmm. there's, well, throughout the ride, um, the weather is progressively getting worse and Clint Eastwood no. is getting yes. sick. Right. Yes. Right. right. Yes. Um, I know we talked, we touched on that little bill English Bob segment for a while, but that stuff's just so good. I felt like we really, it, it really is. I, yeah. I, Clint Eastwood could take a back seat for a second. Hold on, on for a second. second. We're, we're going to get back to Gene you. Gene Hackman has a spotlight. Yeah. <laughs> of course he does. <laughs> but um, we kind of see how, like, the deeper into this mission that they're going is like that William Money is already, like, deteriorating. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it, 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 like, begs the question, like, is he getting sick because of, like, the weather itself or because, like, the thought of doing this again is literally making him like physically sick right. and ill, you know? What uh what I like about it is what I do know actually is like cowboys back in the day, like they would drink in the rain to keep their bodies warm and, and to fight off like infection and sickness. stuff like that. And so I think the fact that he is not taking the drink from Morgan Freeman is like the the reason why he gets sick, maybe. I do think that like the storm itself like symbolizes Clint Eastwood, yeah. right? Yeah. Because like when they do get to town, it's completely like thunder and lightning Horror. and rain, you know? And I saw some cool uh, behind the scenes stuff of like how they were doing these shots and it would be them on the horses riding and a water truck just Falling right next them. to them, just shooting out the water. That's pretty cool. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm just like, that's that movie. I love that movie, movie making magic, yeah. magic, right? Because that rain looks like unbelievably heavy. It you looks know so what good, I mean? Yeah. There was one thing not to track back too much that I feel like we kind of missed was when they first go up to the Schofield kid when they're following him and he doesn't know. Mm-hmm. And he starts shooting. Um, money just falls off of his of his horse. Oh. And, like, he, like, cracks open his head already. Mm-hmm. Like, and I think from, that, from there on, we keep getting these little tropes of, like, well, he used to be this person, but now he's, like, trying to, again, because it almost seems like because he's not drinking, he can, he can barely even keep himself alive at this moment. And... You start to be like, damn, is this is this guy really as is he even gonna make it there? Like withering away, yeah, yeah, like you said, deteriorating, yeah. So they get to the town, mm-hmm. cruise up to the bar. Yep, um, they got their guns. Uh, yeah, well, they don't see the sign apparently. Yeah, they probably honestly they probably I don't did think not did. see it because it's pouring rain, exactly. it's pitch black. Like I, I know how people are. People don't read no fucking signs. Yeah, <laughs> like, did you see the sign that said like people can't uh, even read? There's radiation point. here. Like no, <laughs> just walked in. <laughs> people can't even barely can barely read at this point in time and, too. Yeah, yeah. So they get there and Clint Eastwood looks like shit. Like he's shivering. He is cold. He he does not look good. And Morgan Freeman tells him, "You look like shit." Yeah, he, he literally. Yeah, yeah. And, and so Morgan Freeman and the Schofield kid decide to go play some billiards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's AKA, a term. Yeah. Yeah. There's been no billiard uh, table since, like, they, they said. They burned that for firewood back in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, back, back in the 70s. 70. Back in 70. <laughs> so, yeah, so they go up and they kind of meet up with the, the prostitutes and, uh, you know, whether or not they're talking to them about what's going on or they're getting laid. And um, you see that, yeah, the little word gets a little bill that three cowpokes have rolled in. They're armed. And uh, him and his deputies roll up to the, the saloon. And they find Clint Eastwood just kind of sitting there trying not to die. <laughs> I don't want to get off track too much, but that I, that idea of, like, the billiards table being a joke, <laughs> it just reminds me of the Hateful Eight, like, Minnie's Haberdashery. <laughs> oh, I get it. That's a joke. <laughs> 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 and it's like, kind of like, oh, I thought there was a billiards here. Yeah, you know no. what I mean? No. That means sex. <laughs> 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 And once again, Morgan Freeman being uncontrollably horny, horny in this bastard. scene, right? Yeah. We find out that, you know, oh, you're going to be the guys who uh, handle this job for us. Like, you guys want some freebies? freebies ma- yeah. Because maybe they don't have the $1,000, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. I didn't really connect that until Roy brought that up. Point. That's a good point. 
That is a good point. He's like, yeah, well, we'll give you some sex and 500 bucks. That's and it. Morgan Freeman's Deal. like, I'll take that. I forgot about Sally Two Trees. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh, I mean, you would expect this from the Schofield kid, you For know, sure. because just adding to the story, I'm sure he would be up there with one of those ladies just bragging about how he's killed five people and blah, 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 and mm-hmm. tell my story to the next guy exactly. who's here, you know, but you would expect more out of Morgan Freeman, For honestly. Sure. I would bet no. No. And he's horny. A dirty, he's a dirty <laughs> bastard. He's horny on the main. <laughs> yeah. So then, yeah, Clint Eastwood just starts getting harassed and little Bill, like, you know, yeah, you have a gun. Clint Eastwood, no. He obviously has a gun and they just they kick the shit out of him. It's funny in movies when they tell these lies that are so easily disproved, right? <laughs> yeah, just like, I have a, I don't have a gun. <laughs> what is this? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, it's not loaded. He's like, ding, 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 ding. You know, like, drop out yes, all the bullets. Like, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, man. But, yeah, we get more of the evilness of Little Bill right here. Mm-hmm. Or just, like, how like ruthless this dude is. Yeah. He, he does something we, I wouldn't say hardly ever see, but to see, like, Clint Eastwood just get, you know, whipped, basically. Like, pistol whipped with the gun. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gene Hackman's kicking the shit out of him. Like, just little Bill is like fully little Bill at yeah. this point. You know what I mean? Like, he's completely reverted back to his I'm old not ways. Kicking you? <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. Like, damn. So yeah, that happens, and uh, Ned and the school field kid kind of get they they fall out of the fucking window, <laughs> window and like fall out of their thing. And uh, yeah, they kind of take off, and that's when they end up in they end up in, like the outskirts of town, and Clint Eastwood is like sick and dying almost, right? Yeah. We get another great line from Gene Hackman when he's, like, kicking him out of the bar and into the rain. He's like, well, I guess he's done with the hospitality of, like, big whiskey or whatever. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, he's had his time. Yeah. Yeah, and they have to kind of retreat for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do finally get the – like, after this scene, we do finally get the killings. Yes. Like, of the Cowboys, which is – honestly, it becomes, like, a back burner thing. It's just kind of a – more of a side it's quest at like this we, point. We now. just kind of have to do like we're here to do this, I guess. Like, I guess. Be like, but now there's like a bigger villain. Like, yeah, fuck like, little Bill. Mm-hmm, <laughs> you know exactly. What I mean? So yeah, the, the Clint Eastwood's sick. You know, um, the two others are kind of hanging out in this little shack, and the the prostitutes are coming out giving them freebies. And yeah, Clint Eastwood is just fighting this this sickness and this fever. And I, what is it? Do you remember oh, what he says exactly? God. Yeah, it's we so get a great good. moment of vulnerability here. Um, like we talked about earlier with like these campfire scenes or these sleeping scenes, like, you know, just boys vibing, confiding in each other, mm-hmm. telling them their deepest, darkest secrets. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, they're like little boys at a campfire telling each other stories. And Clint Eastwood's like probably the, maybe the weakest we've ever seen him in a movie. Mm-hmm. I would say other than like in the good, the bad and the ugly, when he's like completely dehydrated and yeah. he looks like SpongeBob and Sandy's <laughs> fucking <Water>! tank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we have him just like wrapped up, shivering, crying. He's talking about seeing his dead wife and Claudia. Claudia. <laughs> Claudia. <laughs> and he tells Ned that he can see the angel of death and he's got snake eyes. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, yeah. it's so good. It's just good as fuck. And then uh, he kind of he he gets better. He does end up yeah. getting better. Takes time for three the days. most part. Yeah. And how fucking long have I been here? Like, three days. In case you did lie, I thought you were an angel. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and the Schofield kid and Ned handle business, correct? Yeah, they, uh, yeah, they, um, they basically they end up like meeting up and they kind of track down where mm-hmm. one of the guys are, the dude who actually didn't cut the girl up, but the other guy, I think. Did we miss that? Was that was that before Clint Eastwood gets like super sick? No, no, it's no, after. it's after. It right? is after. It yeah. is after. Okay, mm-hmm. good. I wanted to make it sure. Seemed, it seems like uh, the Schofield kid and Ned are able. They go and like scout where they are. They, they, they find them, yeah. but then by the time that. Money gets better. All three of them go to go do the deed. Yeah, because then you get you get the scene, and they're on like a they're on like a hill or a cliff, and they're looking down on like the gang of cowboys, and they're like hog tying a calf or something. Yeah. Oh yeah, they, they're they're like hunting, right? Yeah, I wanted to make yeah. sure because I was like, it, it all happens so fast, and that being such like an afterthought of the entire no, movie right, that no. I'm I'm kind of like, wait, where it, is this it scene? Is after because then you get because after they they end up you know they kill one of the people, and then word gets a little bill because he's like. I, he thought they were gone. You know yeah, what I mean? He thought they went south. Exactly. Because I know one of the prostitutes does tell him that, like, Little Bill's not looking for you guys because he thinks you went south. He's pretty mm-hmm. sure he kicked your ass and yeah. then you left, right? So, so yeah, that you get this good, it's a really good scene because you have Morgan Freeman and he, he shoots the, the dude's horse. Um, and the dude falls off the horse and he kind of gets pinned. And then Morgan Freeman, like, you know, he's a, he's a dead shot. He's got a dead eye. And he has him in his sights and he basically, you know, he can't do it. He can't, he can't kill him. And he kind of comes to the realization, like, I am done with this life. And so yeah. then you get Clint Eastwood. He grabs a gun and last shot he hits him. 
You know what I mean? Yeah, he does miss, too. It's like the tension in that scene, the buildup. I'm like, is he going to get him? Oh, he missed. Oh, mm-hmm. he missed. And he does a, a really, like, nice touch. Not nice as in, like, what a good guy, but, like, a, a cool little touch of the movie is that he lets him get the water. You right. know what I mean? Because the guy's like, I'm dying of thirst. Yeah. I'm like, well, you're dying of a bullet yeah, wound, actually. Got, yeah, exactly. But, yeah, I get that you're thirsty. But he, so. lets, his, he lets his friend run over there and give him some water. Like, give him some water. And console damn. him. And he's like, you know, we're not monsters kind of thing, but it's like... <laughs> Like, right, how, right. how do we find humanity in this spot where, like, it's just such a weird... It's just weird, you and know it's what like, I you mean? killed him, god damn it. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you know how much money you guys are worth? And, like, nobody nobody looks like they feel good about it. Clint Eastwood doesn't look exactly. very happy. Ned, this basically leads up to Ned leaving. Like, yeah. he's like, I'm done, I'm going to go home. No money. No. Yeah, he's like, I don't care. I'm getting that. I'm the getting freebies were enough. <laughs> 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 he's already been taking the The deposit. syphilis that I just... <laughs> Contracted is yeah. enough. I got enough to explain to Sally two trees when I get home. Oh. I explain that. Yeah, rash, bro. Nah, we slept in some uh, weird brush. It was <laughs> poison ivy. It was really knowing cold. what we know it about how Ned's story ends, it's probably a good thing he didn't have to deal with Sally yeah, two yeah. trees. Yeah, <laughs> that's why she was Same mad. Same would have happened. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so Ned takes off. Um, um, this is kind of the end of the story with the Schofield kid too. Pretty much. Yeah, and I did want to touch on one last thing about the Schofield kid is that uh, when Clint Eastwood gets his ass kicked, he's trying to find, he's doing these mental gymnastics in his head of like, how can I justify this in my head to make it make sense? Because like you guys have said, that he glorifies Will Money so much that he's like, well, his gun must have jammed. Right. Or mm, yeah. maybe because he's sick or maybe he was so drunk or whatever because it, it's just not registering He's like, him. he should have killed everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that's very, like, that's that one last like reality punch to the Schofield kid before the Everything killings. Everything shatters. Yeah, before yeah. the killings. Because the Schofield kid takes out the other guy in like a pretty ruthless That's way. That's brutal. <laughs> Shoots Basically, him while he's on the shitter. Honestly, like a total representation of the canteen shot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like just Oh, true. You know what I mean? So, he didn't need glasses for that exactly. one. Exactly. Yeah. And how glorious is that? You know what I mean? And it shatters him. It mm-hmm. breaks him. It does. Yeah, because they, they end up tracking the other guy down to like, you know, like a ranch or some shit like that and yeah, he just goes up to... He, he's in an outhouse. They wait out for him for a while. That's where the experience of Clint Eastwood's character comes into play because they, they're they like, where is he going to go? And he's like, he's going to go here. Because mm-hmm. that's like... He's, he's just going to wait there until a couple of days pass by yeah. and he thinks we're already gone or whatever and then they're going to leave. And they stake it out, that's like you point. said. He's like, yeah, he's, he's, he's going to hole up with his friends. Like, he's not going to go be alone. He's not going to risk not being protected. He's going to go hole up in the ranch. So, yeah, they, they kind of stake that out. And then once the dude that they're looking for uses the outhouse finally, um, Schoolfield kid basically walks up, opens the wrong outhouse door because his fucker can't see. And then everybody kind of sees what's going on, and he, he just opens the other door really fast and blasts his fool, like, five or six times. And again, does get lucky because he said, like, Guy's trying to reach for his pistol, trying to take a shit, you know, and he just can't. It's like what little Bill had alluded to about, yeah, about that. Like, like the, yeah, like he only didn't kill English Bob because his gun was jammed. Yeah. Same thing here. This guy's going to be a hero, but it's only because he was taking, taking a shit. shit. And yeah. that's not what the story is going to be. The story is going to yeah. be that he took him out, like all the stories he's been talking about taking out five people. Yeah. And that's what he's going to tell people. And that's what a writer's going to put in a book. And then. Later, people are going to think this guy's this big epic legend for taking out this guy who cut off the girl's teeth, eyes, ears. Yeah. And, you know, it just keeps adding and adding to this, like, mythos. It's so good. Yeah. God. <laughs> so, yeah, he, they cap the last guy, and then they, they take off from there. And Little Bill is not having it. Yeah, and at that point, I know I just watched it earlier today, but the Schofield kid leaves, right? And after, Clint Eastwood is on his they own. Kill, so they kill the last guy. They go back out to that shack that Clint Eastwood was getting healthy at, like on the outskirts of town. And that's when one of the prostitutes brings the money and gives it to – they give, gives, gives him the money. And uh, ah, okay. Will Money basically says, now. like, take the money, go back, give my half to my kids and tell my kids if I'm not back in whatever, like four days or whatever the fuck he says, then give half the money to Ned or – Sally, two Sally, trees. Two trees. Sally two trees, and then this is where we find out that that the like um, he they don't know or, or money doesn't know he, that Ned has been gone right caught. until the the prostitute tells him that that's when the prostitute tells him that um, Ned got caught by yeah. Bill because of the money because he's like give your half to Sally like why be like oh you didn't know like Ned is Ned is dead I'm like yeah Ugh. God and we, we kind of went over the scene where. The, tor- the Ned torture scene and stuff like that, but... 
Yeah, that, that's tough. I mean, that obviously tough, doesn't yeah. conjure up good things no. in your brain, no. of like especially during the time. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, exactly. Oh man, they're, so well, they're whipping him, but they didn't whip the two cowboys. Exactly. You know what I mean? But Ned, because yeah, he hits it. They 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 caught Ned when Ned left, um, and yeah, they tortured him and they ended up killing him. I gotta bring this up because I had told you guys how funny this was that I was watching the behind the scenes of this thing, and it's a shot of Morgan Freeman like between. Um, like while well, they're taking a break or Takes, whatever. Yeah. And, yeah. And he's like, I wouldn't say twerking, but he's literally like on the cell, on the cell, like shaking his butt back and forth, like <laughs> laughing, like, <laughs> oh, yeah. and then it's like, okay, action. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why you had, you, uh, we watched uh, Dave Chappelle. <laughs> the his, Chappelle show. His roots skit for roots. Takes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> it reminded you of when the same thing. It just makes it seem like well, and that's probably that's that's what it's like. Obviously, you got to keep it like very. I would say make it funny. It seems like a very like it's hard a, thing to go through. It's a tough scene, yeah. One thing I did want to touch upon was um, right before the Schofield kid le- leaves. Once he finds out that we find out that this is actually his first kill, and he's like really really stressing out about it, he and like he's breaks just down. yeah, and he's decided he's never gonna kill anybody again. He gives Hunt money his gun, tells him you can keep that. I'm never gonna use that, and he's like just downing this bottle, and when. Money finds out that Little Bill has Ned. This is where we get like that switch. We see that he takes the bottle from the Schofield kid and basically almost is like, okay, now I have to turn back into my old self. We get the real money, the legend money, you know. Um, and I think we could we start to feel the disdain that even Clint Eastwood's character has for returning back to this person. Like, I have to get really, really drunk here to be able to process what I'm about to feel and I'm where, where I'm about to go emotionally to be able to do what I'm about to do. Yeah, he basically, he, start, he, had, he has to revert back to who he used to be because mm-hmm. he basically makes the decision that I'm going to go fucking kill little Bill. So, and that basically sets up the, the finale of the movie, which is Clint Eastwood rides back into town. It's a dark fucking night. <sighs> And then, yeah, he basically, I don't know, is Little Bill in the bar when they cruise in? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, he is. So everybody's all up in the bar, and he's there with Bo Champs and everything else, and Clint Eastwood kind of comes in, and everybody's like, oh, fuck. Because we see, I, I, I think it's uh, interesting, we see Ned being put out there, right? He's yeah. being displayed, as, displayed yeah. as like a... No assassin. This is what happens to assassins or whatever. And yeah. then we get the scene of Gene Hackman talking to them, and all of a sudden we just see a gun being present. Oh, he's telling them he's like... That he, they're plotting to go find Will Money. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. he's like, oh, a drink for you for helping me. Drink for you. He's like, drink for you. And he's like, and don't spend all your money because you're going to need it when we're going on this mission. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, you hear, you like hear and see the shotgun. You and know? He, he, goes, what, he says something along the lines of like, who's in charge here? Mm, like, that's, who's yeah. the leader? Yeah. And everybody's like, uh, and he's like, fat ass. Like, who? tell me who the fucking leader is or whatever. Yeah, and fat then, ass. Yeah. <laughs> and then, he, yeah, and he blasts Skinny. Skinny gets blasted. Like, like, he made it like, no thought. Gene Hackman's like, you're a coward, sir. He's like, he was an unarmed man. He's like, well, maybe he should have been armed. <laughs> yeah, he should, he oh should have been armed putting my friend out. Like, he's like, to display like that all mm-hmm. over his establishment. Yeah. Yep. So... I mean, it's not like Skinny's a good guy. I mean, there is no good guys in like this. Like everybody is very There's ambiguous. lesser evils. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and one thing I found really interesting about this is it's it's really funny because money's like actually outnumbered here by like, a lot. By yeah. a lot. But it almost goes Basically, back to no. He's not outnumbered. Every single person in the bar except for him. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it's it's just interesting because like it goes kind of goes back to the Schofield kid. Like they all have guns, but none of them seem maybe they're. It also goes back to English Bob is like they're in such awe that they're here. Here is money, the money, the legend, right? That they don't even seem like they can shoot like they've ever had to actually shoot those guns. So as soon as they have like those numbers on them, they just like Stormtrooper aim the whole thing. <laughs> I just thought it was it, it just really is, again, like playing on the trope of an anti-Western. Like you would think because he's outnumbered, we're going to see Clint Eastwood about to take out all of these and like before they could even get a shot off. And that's not what happened. He should have got done done up like Alonzo in training day. Like, the Russians. Yeah. <laughs> but he fucking, he takes out every single yeah. person. He fucks them all up. He shoots little Bill. Um, he, he has this great scene with, with this little part with Bochamps where he's kind of talking to him mm-hmm. and... Oh my god! He even tell, b- tells Bo Chance to grab a gun. Yeah, and then he's like, "Oh, I'm a writer," and he's like, "Letters, novels, like, what do you do?" And then he, Bo Chance, once again, just being like, "I'm moving on from English Little Bob to, to Little Bill to like, oh, can I write your Who story you? now?" Yeah. yeah, just he's a parasite, honestly. Yeah, he is. He's a he's he's a leech. 
And then you have, you, you get Clint Eastwood, Will Money, dr- you know, having to drink at the bar with all these dead people. And he tells everybody else to get the fuck out unless you want to die. And everybody gets <laughs> the fuck out. And then you see Little Bill still alive. And he reaches for his pistol. And you get this one of my favorite shots in cinema with when, when Will Money is over Little Bill to shock. And then you get it like up from Little Bill's perspective. And Little Bill basically just says, like, I'll see you in hell. And Clint Eastwood says, yeah. yeah. And he blasts his fucking head off. <laughs> it's just like, holy shit. Yeah, it's awesome. It is awesome. Yeah. It's just, oh, my and God. And it's still not the end. No, not the end. He's He's got to diffuse the situation for himself so he can get himself out of town. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> he goes outside, and he just he starts yelling at everybody. He's like, if, if anybody you want to come after me or you want to report me, I'll kill you. I'll kill your wife. I'll burn your fucking house down. Like, Damn. This is where he becomes like just complete villain. Just, or not, yes, I would say a villain, even though we're rooting for him at this point, is he just completely is not the person that Delilah was like. That that man respects his wife, and then she finds out that he does, that she's dead. He's got dragon energy. Yeah. (laughs) He's basically turned into a dragon. You get the old Will Money, the bad motherfucker that everybody talked about, and you get to see what he's all about, and he's a bad son of a bitch. Because even we get the. very near the end, we get the scene where they could take him out. There's a person that had the deputy has the gun, yeah. and then he's like, "I'm not about he's to too shoot scared. that." Yeah. He's too scared. And he says, "You know, if if you, I'll come back and yeah, I'll kill you guys, burn your houses down. You better leave the whores alone. Mm-hmm. If if I hear, like, I'm the police now. Like, I'm, I'm the come sheriff back. now. Yeah. I'm in charge of this place. <laughs> and if I find out anything's going wrong, I'm going to come back." And he's like the boogeyman now. Mm-hmm. Where he's the angel of death. He saw the angel of death, and now he is With the angel snake of death. Eyes. <laughs> the benevolence that he leaves for the kids to be like, make sure that you know that your mom is overwatching you at all times is is like juxtaposed to how he leaves the city in terms of like, I lurk over you guys. And if you guys ever fuck up, Ooh, I will yeah. come back. And he even says too, he's like, you better give Ned a proper burial. If oh, I come yeah. back and he's not. <laughs> yeah, you're fucked. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's basically, that's basically in the movie. And then I, I love the, cause you know, Westerns, they ride off into the sunset. Mm-hmm. This motherfucker rides off into the rain. You know what I mean? Like, it's a dark, rainy night. It's just, it's not the traditional ending. And cinematography here towards the, these last 15 minutes of the movie are just just spectacular, yeah. honestly. Those night shots of him trying to, like, getting on the horse just looks so good. And the, the shadows and the bar. The shadows, thing, yeah. Like, it's, oh, man. So good. It's really good. And then, yeah, you kind of get the final title card that it's back on their pig farm. And it basically just says, supposedly... Will Money took his kids, and they went out to San Francisco, and they prospered in dry goods. And then you get this little, this the fact that um, his his Claudia's mom, his dead wife's mom, ended up making it out to their homestead to see where her daughter was buried, and she never could understand why Claudia wanted to be with mm-hmm. you know Will Money, and that kind of ties in the whole fact of he's unforgiven, you know, yeah. and that's the movie. That is, yes, that is the movie. This movie is awesome. And yeah. we talked about it way longer than I thought <laughs> I, we would. I, I know. Because, I, I mean, it, I like this movie now even more than I did after just watching it this morning. Yeah, like, yeah. The first time I watched it, I was like, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I, I, I get it. You know, I, I could see why you like that. I know I had told you that, I was like, maybe because Westerns aren't a genre that I'm so into that the all of the talking about the tropes and subverting them and all of that it doesn't hit for me the same way but then i've seen this movie twice now and after talking about it for like damn near two hours <laughs> i'm i really really like this movie. i do too yeah like i can i can see why you feel this way yeah about this. like this this movie is it's been in my top 10 and i think it will probably stay in my top 10 maybe forever um this is just a movie that every time i come back to it i I love it, and I almost get a new appreciation for it. And it's like, I, like I understand, like it is a western. Maybe some people think it's slow or whatever, but it's just not only is it a phenomenal, in my opinion, perfect movie, but the fact that like like we've talked about, it ties in so much of you know, air quotes, the metaverse of westerns. Like it's just, eh, I love this movie. I think yeah, hearing you talk about how much you love it, having seen it more than more times than me and Gus have. Being able to hear your enthusiasm for what these scenes mean to you outside just like your love for cinema, what it connects to, like apart from that. It's like, yeah, you're right. This is a really good movie. And I could see how after giving it more watches, you would just start liking it more and more and more. And there's there's a lot here. And obviously, even we broke it down as best as we could and we still miss things. Oh, for sure. Yeah, there's yeah. so much shit. There's so many things I thought about, about saying mm-hmm. where I was like, let's just I'll just leave it. I do want to say that I love the score of this movie. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yes. Clint Eastwood did. He did not write it, but he worked with the, the music writer. Um, it's just so good. It's just it's very different than traditional westerns like the music is almost more 
like melancholic. It's not triumphant. And, exactly. It's it's melancholic. It's sad. You know. Um, yeah. I feel like it's a lot of strings, mm-hmm. and a lot of uh, other westerns have like horns, right? Or drums. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Or na 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 na. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's very subdued for what is half of a subdued movie. You know what I mean? I would say the movie's like half subdued, half action. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the the score and the cinematography together. Yeah, Chef's kiss. Give me some of that. Yeah, <laughs> give this, me that. This movie reminds me of uh, there's David Lynch when he talks about his movies and people try to ask him to explain them. He's like, I just don't like doing that because you're asking me to explain an art that is shown through you for a reason visually to put it into words. This is how I explained it by the movie. The movie, like yeah. that's that's me. So like every time we try to break down a movie that's this good, same thing happened with Ron. We almost want to talk to you guys about it all of it because that's how important the thing is it's not just these cool scenes put together these these well very well told stories are like they can only be explained through watching it and we're just trying to break them down as best as we can and let you guys know why we like them so much because we feel that when we're watching it it just feels like a special movie yeah so movies are mad important very well put yeah definitely Mm -hmm. um what do you think should we do are we going to keep doing the numbers thing, like one through five, or would you want to do like just recommend or like, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down type of deal? I mean, bro, five out of five, highly recommend. Yeah, <laughs> this I feel movie, like, yeah, like, I love this movie. I dude. feel like even like I thought it was a four, but then I could see it as a five, but then to me, it's like, it, it, that does not matter, honestly. Like, yeah. What does the four or the five really mean? You yeah, know, like, it, it's, it's almost, is irrelevant. it a perfect movie? No, but yes, it is. I think, you know, yeah, I think, I mean, this movie. One best picture. Uh, Gene Hackman won best supporting actor. Like, there's we're not breaking ground here by saying it's amazing. I, this I is one of the few times they got it right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. This is one of the this few times they sweep. got it right. Like, it and, was a good sweep. And I think it it goes back to what you were saying. Like, it was an ode to a genre that is basically that was the last nail in the coffin. Yeah. And for G or for Clint Eastwood to be the person to do that, like it just seemed very telling and. I could I, I could see you after more repeating how this could easily be a five and I think it's only it was a four for me too but I think it's because I'm just watching it now it's 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 the more I see it us talking about it be like this movie does have everything that a five I think a five should have anything with Gene Hackman's a five <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> welcome to Mooseport five <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah man I mean highly recommend yes. so either four or five thumbs up. Go see this movie. Pistols in the air. Yeah. yeah. Bang, bang. <laughs> uh, it's on HBO Max. If you I don't, if you don't have HBO Max, I'm sure you could get it on like Prime Just or iTunes a free trial or something. or something. Yeah. Come on. It looks amazing on HBO Max. It does. Way. Yeah. It looks so it does. good. Um, yeah, man. I mean, no code word. No. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, okay. whatever. Yeah. I feel like I'm pretty much done. Yeah. I think, I think we touched on everything that we pretty much can. So if you're watching this on YouTube, like, subscribe, comment, share. Come on, guys. You know the deal already. Um, <laughs> Leave us a review if you're on iTunes or Spotify or something like that. Um, help boost us past Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Rogan. Um, no, if you no know, misinformation we also, here. We also will be pulling from Spotify. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you hear that? Spotify. <laughs> Anyways, uh, thanks for checking in, guys. We're checking out Grand Cinema Hotel, Unforgiven. Amazing. Fucking awesome. Yep. All right, Let guys. us know what you guys think. Have a good one. Later. Bye. Bye. Bye.